Welcome, everybody. Welcome to OEN Engage. Thank you so much for joining us for today's session, Tips and Best Practices for Hosting the Intro to OER Adoption Workshop. My name is Tanya Groves, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Ed Network. First, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we kicked off the week yesterday with the OEN Land Acknowledgement and the OEN Community Norms. If you'd like to review them, Karen, drop them um, in the chat. Uh, we welcome you to share your local land acknowledgement um, in the chat if you wish to do so, or you could visit the Native Land Digital site to learn about the lands that our community members inhabit and dig deeper into our relationships with their heritage, the resources they share, and how we can actively be a part of a better future moving forward. Um, I am presenting from St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, which resides on unceded lands of the Dakota people. Uh, this session is being recorded to benefit those in our community and those who are unable to attend or have to attend a little late or have to leave early, um, and links will be shared out after the event as well. If you have any comments or questions during the session, please submit them via chat and we'll do our best to address them. And now, if you would please join me in welcoming today's presenters. Thank you, presenters, so much for joining us and, and sharing your tips and best practices and knowledge. Uh, we have Maria Taylor, uh, who is the Open Educational Resources Librarian from Berea College, University of o Berea College. We have Jim Salisbury, the Reference OER Librarian from the Community College of Rhode Island. We have Amy Hoffer, Statewide Open Education Program Director for Open Educational Open Oregon Educational Resources. We have Gabby Hernandez, Open Education Librarian from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, and Micah Jeltima, um, here in Minnesota, our Open Education and Affordable Content Librarian at the University of Minnesota. Um, so today uh, we are going to go in the order I just said. Um, and there's gonna be no break between presenters. We're just gonna keep going um, so that they can share all of their wonderful tips and best practices. And then we'll take some questions at the end. Um, so Maria, I will turn it over to you. Hi everybody. I'm Maria Taylor, the OER librarian at Berea College. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm going to begin by providing you a little bit of context about our institution. So Berea is a small liberal arts college in Kentucky that was the first integrated co-educational college in the South. The college was founded by an ardent abolitionist and the college's great commitments perpetuate those social justice ideals and guide our work today. Um, so our students do not pay tuition in the fall of 2023, 95% of our first year students were Pell eligible. So Berea is also a federally recognized work college. So all of our students work on campus. The Open Berea initiative began with the creation of the new OER librarian position. And that role was filled last summer in July, 2023. So we're a relatively new program. And I'm going to share a few tips about hosting um, OER adoption workshops based on my experiences in this last academic year. So first off, the OEN slide deck is so helpful. <laughs> it's a great place to get started and um, customize for your specific context. So one of the things that I've done to align with my institution's values um, is integrating some content from Jasmine Roberts Cruz OEN presentation about creating a socially just open education, uh, since that content is related to our college's values. Another thing that you can do um, is use, I use Google Slides, so I have integrated Poll Everywhere into my presentation. Um, that helps me gauge um, the level of prior OER knowledge of the attendees and also gauge their interests as well. Um, so that helps me determine how I'm going to have the flow of the presentation go. <laughs> um, so basically, I do the anonymous polling questions and um, that allows me to 
know how far to delve into what is OER. Um, if we have people that are more knowledge, knowledgeable about the basics, then um, maybe we do a little bit more related to what are different places to look, what are um, some other ancillary options and things like that. Um, so as far as including um, state and local data, if your state has a textbook cost survey for students, try to incentivize it um, so that you can include that data as well. And um, if you have any surveys that your students participate in on campus that you could potentially add questions to, um, that was something we did with our entering student survey. And we were, allowed, we were able to get data that we could include in our presentation from that. I've also adapted the slide deck for shorter presentations. So for example, I've used it for a faculty meeting um, and also for launch week, which is our faculty training series that is offered before the fall semester begins. Um, so I think it's useful in a lot of different um, contexts. And then finally this fall, I'm gonna be meeting with departments and divisions. So I'm gonna modify the presentation to highlight resources based on the specific subject. Um, for example, I'm gonna be meeting with the psychology department. And when I discuss ancillaries, I'm gonna show them the Moodle course shell that I've created um, to demonstrate the new OpenStax assignable, um, which allows you to add additional OpenStax content um, into the LMS, such as their videos or questions um, that pair with that specific OpenStax textbook. So that's another thing I'm gonna be trying out. Um, next, I would say leverage your resources. So we have an opportunity when we're in front of faculty to promote our resources and services. Um, I include information about upcoming programming, our OER grants, consultations, web resources, and also um, take that opportunity to advertise the professional development opportunities and tools that are available from the OEN and also from our consortial and state partners. So things like the Open Pedagogy Learning Circle, um, things going on for Open Ed Week uh, for Affordable Learning Kentucky and, and different things like that. And then finally, it's a great opportunity to get feedback. Um, you've got your captive audience there. Um, so I gather feedback about faculty needs for resources and future professional development. And as, as well as ways to be able to improve the workshop in the future. So I'm currently working on scaffolding professional development for our OER um, program as part of the action plan that I'm doing for the OEN certificate in open education librarianship. And that survey data that I have gathered from my OER adoption workshops has really helped me in expanding our program. And then I also use the OER or the OEN adoption survey. Um, but the one thing that I have found is that it's really helpful to let people know in advance to expect it. Uh, they're more likely to respond if they know to be on the lookout for it. Um, so those are just some of the, the suggestions that I have or the things that, um, that I have been doing this past year. Hi, uh, Tim Salisbury from CCRI, Community College of Rhode Island. Um, a little background about CCRI and, uh, and Rhode Island. Uh, we are about 11,000 full and part-time students. Uh, because Rhode Island is as large as it is, we do have four campuses across the state that's 50 miles north to south and 40 miles east to west because we don't travel well. Um, so um, we have uh, tuition free for all high school students with the Rhode Island Promise Scholarship that was instituted uh, this past year. And uh, it's been a very successful program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in, in terms of um, how I operate, I'm a very informal person and I try to keep things simple and easy 
I have a, a, a personal mantra, uh, three things that I kind of focus on, which is a sense of self, a sense of others, and a sense, excuse me, and a sense of humor. Uh, and I approach all of my uh, workshops use, trying to keep that in mind. Uh, I generally present in probably three different audiences. Uh, Professional Development Day, which is uh, a large, as I say, cross-section of faculty, staff, and administration. And in those presentations, I keep it very general, focus on cost savings. I show some of the major resources available and try to point out the importance of OER for student success, student retention. Uh, we do workshops through our um, through the library as well as through our Center for Teaching Excellence. Those are smaller groups that uh, run between 10 and 20 people. And I, I try to drill down to be more specific. I have an idea of who the audience is in advance. So if there's you know, a couple of people from, I would say, the biology department, I'll push towards showing that it, uh, biology resources. Uh, and uh, and like I said, I drill down and spend more time giving them more specific information about uh, different OER resources. The third presentation, which is generally twice a year, with fall and spring semester, is the new faculty orientation. With those, I, I focus on the background and the history of OER here at Community College and how important it is on the impact on, on our students. Because again, as a community college, we're primarily first generation college students, a lot of English language learners, and we've been recently designated uh, Hispanic serving institution. So we have a very, uh, uh, sometimes challenging population. And it's important to, you know, to provide as many resources free for the students as possible. Uh, the other part of knowing your audience for, for me is that uh, over the years I have come to uh, consciously or unconsciously uh, divide my audience into three different categories. And I call them the believers, the curious, and the skeptics. Uh, the believers are the people that have already adopted OER. And uh, for me, it's important to acknowledge them publicly and thank them for their support and their interest in, in pushing this initiative. Uh, and I have what, what I call the, the curious that attend these workshops because A, they, they want to learn more, they're not sure about it, but, uh, but they're interested enough to, to come in and learn more. Uh, again, as, as part of the, you know, having a sense of others is always acknowledging them, thanking them for, for showing up and being interested enough to learn more about OER here. Uh, my last category that, uh, that I see are, are the skeptics, those that don't have time to adopt or adapt, those that can't find anything that's as good as what they're using, and, uh, and, and just, uh, again, it's important to acknowledge them and I always thank them for being interested enough, even though they're skeptics and they're not, they don't think it's the right thing for them. I, I thank them for showing up to at least, you know, try to learn more. And I encourage them, you know, to, to, uh, to, to have a conversation with me uh, so we can perhaps move forward. Um, the, the other big thing that, that I do is, and, and this hasn't changed, I've been OER, the OER person here since 2017 when the, the initiative first came to Rhode Island. And, and the questions really haven't changed uh, from, from 2017 to now. And it's, it's important, I think, to anticipate uh, 
what those questions are or what they are probably going to be is and frequently things like our, our OER as good as the resources I'm using, where can I find OER, um, and can I combine different sources? To, uh, so those are questions that have always come up, and um, I have those in mind as I'm presenting. Uh, the other thing that really works for me, and I probably maybe works for other people, but not everyone, is that I do very limited slides. I'm more of a stream of consciousness person. And um, rather than have a separate question and answer period, I'm much more comfortable answering questions in the middle of my presentation. Um, I, For me, it, it works because uh, I can give somebody immediate uh, feedback. And I think I get more questions because we don't, Sometimes questions are lost at the end. You know, after a 30 minute presentation, the question you had 10 minutes in is gone. And uh, so for me, it's very important to have uh, a, more of an open discussion than a presentation. And that's about uh, my story. Oh, the last thing, I'm sorry, is that um, I forgot about this. Uh, I do show some data and the national data, uh, as important as it is, uh, sometimes gets lost in the, in the shuffle. And after, when we reopened after uh, COVID, I, I did a survey on campus I'm at, which is the largest campus, and the results were remarkably similar to all the national surveys. But the one thing I did that I found has, has really resonated with uh, my faculty is that our student workers, we pay them $14 an hour. And after tax deductions, it comes out that our students would have to work eight and a half hours to buy one textbook. And uh, it's something that's really resonated with faculty because they don't generally consider what the cost is of the textbook they're assigning. But when, when a student's working eight and a half hours and they have a maximum 15 hour a week shift, uh, it's a serious imposition on, on their ability to attend and succeed in college. And, and it's a, I think it's an important factor that I use to uh, encourage faculty to move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I'm Amy Hoffer from Open Oregon Educational Resources. And let's go to the next slide. Um, I have an exclamation point here because the numbers are big. We have done 131 OER review workshops since 2015. And using the OEN's $100 multiplier, we estimate that students have saved over $13 million since then. And that comes out to over $50 in student savings per program dollar spent. And that's a much higher ratio than anything else that we do in our program. And that's why when people ask, is it worth it to join the OEN? I always say, yes, if you have some funding, do this. It's been really effective in Oregon. Let's go to the next slide. So um, I'm a statewide, um, at a statewide context, there are 17 community colleges and seven universities in Oregon. And before COVID, I had a travel budget. I would travel all around the state to each institution offering in-person workshops. And um, once the pandemic started, we changed our model to offer virtual statewide workshops. And we'll pick a week of the quarter, um, trying to avoid midterms and finals in week one. Um, and offer three different days and times during that week, always including a 5 p.m. time for part-time faculty that have day jobs. And um, even though we're going back to a lot of in-person offerings now um, across the state, I don't have a travel budget anymore. And um, the virtual statewide workshop model has been a lot more inclusive because we're geographically really big. So we have stuck with um, that pandemic era model. We're bringing it forward into the future. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So a couple of Oregon specific things. Um, one is that we have two review options. One is to receive a $200 stipend to review a book. 
in the open textbook library. And the other option is to review a something else that's not a textbook from any source um, for a $300 stipend. And the stipend's a little higher because we think you might have to search in more than one repository or consult with a librarian or maybe pull together multiple resources to add up to a curriculum for a whole quarter. Um, this idea was innovated by Jennifer Landtrip, who at the time was a librarian at Umpqua Community College. And you'll have the slide deck. There's a link to an article that she wrote about it. Um, and um, so she piloted um, this model at Umpqua and then we scaled it up statewide. And it lets me um, say yes to people who don't see a textbook that they wanna use in the open textbook library or don't wanna use a textbook as a format, you know, um, or maybe it's somebody who wants to review um, a library resource that they might use as course materials. So it just lets me say yes to more different options and the non-OTL reviews go into a folder in OER Commons. Um, and then another thing I wanted to show that's Oregon specific is a couple of the slides that I've modified the um, OEN deck with. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, so this is from an infographic provided by our Higher Education Coordinating Commission, our statewide agency. And I tell people there's a link at the bottom. You can, you know, take a look. This is an average for all 24 institutions. Um, this infographic is also available for just the colleges, just the universities, and also per institution. So you can see how your own institution stacks up. It's a really dense slide. There's a couple of things that I like to call people's attention to. The first is that 34%, um, a third of students were unable to meet expenses with expected resources, meaning family contributions, student earnings, and grant aid. So that um, really shows the scale of the issue that we're talking about. And then um, I also call people's attention to the cost of attendance components, um, which is kind of like a vertical pie chart um, in this version of the infographic. Um, they've represented it as like a Chevron chart in the past. I don't know um, how they make their design choices, but you can see that about half of the cost of attendance goes to room and board. We do have a housing crisis all over the state here in Oregon. And then you can see on down the line that books and supplies are about 5% of the total cost of attendance. And um, this sets me up really well for the slide that says, you know, here are the costs of attendance, um, but what can we do? It's hard to move the needle on housing, tuition, et cetera. With books and supplies, instructors really do have, um, you know, an opportunity to make a direct impact through their choices. Um, and I, it also lets me say, you know, is it really worth it if it's only 5% and that I've done the research and the answer is yes, small dollar amounts really can create an emergency that can really change a student's um, academic career. Um, and I, you know, let people pause on those and go backwards and forwards because it is a lot of information. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So this is the um, example slide for Blueprint for Success in College and Career by Dave Dillon. I always show my print copy and that it looks just like any other textbook. It was about $15 after shipping. Um, and I love talking about this book. So Dave Dillon um, is at Grossmont Community College. He took a sabbatical and he made a remix of the best available um, OER for um, college success. He included two Oregon authors, Phyllis Nasilla and Alice Lamoureux from Lane Community College. His book won a textbook excellence award. It was the first openly licensed textbook to win this award. Um, and then in Oregon, we got some pandemic relief funding and we made an Oregon version of Dave's book. And then we translated the Oregon version into Spanish. And all of these remixes and revisions are possible because the original content had the open license on it. So this is just a really fun example to talk about. So let's go on. I have one more slide. Um, and these are my tips. And I'm going to really echo what Jim said. Um, so um, I do like to pare down my slide deck, as he said, so that there's plenty of time for questions and search demonstrations. I also like to take questions as I go so that I can expand on the things that people are interested in hearing more about. Um, and I like to turn questions back to the group. So some of the questions that always come up are going to be like, well, so why have textbooks gotten so expensive since 1975 or, you know, wherever that 
chart starts um, and I'll say, yeah, good question. What do you all think? Or, you know, hey, can you explain what the different symbols mean on the Creative Commons licenses? And especially if there's another librarian in the room, I'll try to get somebody else to go through what all the different symbols mean on the licenses. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have to cover everything. People will um, ask me to expand if they want to know more about something. And I don't have to provide all the answers myself because um, people are going to probably answer each other's questions um, by having a discussion. Um, I know we talked about don't demonize um, in the earlier session this morning, and it's advice that's been in every um, Open Education Network training that I've attended. It's such great advice. It really holds up. Um, it's easy for the conversation to kind of go negative on bookstore managers or um, your colleagues who publish under all rights reserved or your colleagues who assign access codes and just really setting the tone that we're all here to support student success. We're all doing our best under very constrained resources. We're all colleagues, right? That's really important. Um, and then the last thing that I found is the logistics will always be confusing. And I kind of do that to myself by offering the something else option um, that people can write a review that's not of an open textbook. But I think either way, just be prepared to answer a bunch of questions about that in your session. And then following up by email, you will get more questions. Um, yeah, people just need to hear things a few times. And that's what I got, thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Gabby Hernandez. I'm the Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, I also a little bit about our institution. We are, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we are a four-year public institution. We have about 30,000 students, and we're one of the largest Hispanic-serving institutions in the United States. We're right on the border of Texas and Mexico. We have a large number of first generation and Pell eligible students. Um, so our demographic looks a lot like a community college, but we are a four year institution. Um, we have a tuition advantage program at UTRGV. So any student whose family makes less than $125,000 doesn't have tuition and fees if they're getting um, their first undergraduate degree. So obviously affordability is key here at UTRGV to ensure that we're providing education to our students. Um, and, you know, I set that up a little bit to let you know that our students are in need and are thankfully our faculty greatly understand this need as well as our administration. Um, UTRGV is winning um, wonderful awards and recognition for the work they're doing for um, retention for first-gen students and just all the things. So they're, they're really working on just affordability um, overall. So it is kind of natural for us to have a textbook affordability program. Um, our program itself has been, um, it's been the last four years. It started with a part-time open education librarian. And within those years, we've grown to a full-time open education librarian, a graduate assistant, a library assistant, and a new, we'll have a new digital projects intern coming to us as well, as well as lots of campus partners that we work with, which include our um, Office of Faculty Success, and they're the ones who help us with faculty outreach and grant funding. We have our Center for Teaching Excellence who help us host presentations so we can get this information out to faculty. Um, we have our instructional design team helping embed OER, the registrar and IT who are both helping us with our course marking um, designations. And you know, with all of that staffing and support, we're able to offer quite a few services to our faculty. And we've had uh, a great impact so far. So we've had 900 faculty engage in the textbook affordability program in some way, shape or form. And we've impacted 12,000 students and have a very conservative $1.3 million saved for our students, which feels really great. Uh, next slide. With all of that landscape and background, I wanted to talk about how we just educate faculty overall about OER. And we have, I've created a tiered professional development system so that way faculty, faculty can jump in and out depending on their need and their interest. So the first two that we have are um, Texas Learn OER and the OEN Review. And so I like to call them our mini professional development grants. 
And what Texas Learn OER provides is it provides a space for faculty just to learn about OER and definitions and what is it. And I've provided the slides to that so you can kind of see how I talk to faculty about this. I am not the one who gives them the information. I just kind of use it as an introductory, like the library is here, we exist, we have these services, we can help with OER and textbook affordability. And, you know, and that's really the whole presentation. And then I provide them that time to dig through those learning modules, the online learning modules to kind of figure out what OER is. Um, we've had really, really great feedback from our faculty on that. Some of the things that they have said about the opportunity is um, coming from multiple faculty responses is all faculty should take this training just as a knowledge base. Um, and some of them even asked for further engagement opportunities. So, you know, this helps for when I don't have funding that I can tell administrators and things for that continuous sustainability is our faculty really want this and we need to continue these efforts. Um, a lot of them appreciated the opportunity to learn without the adoption pressure. And that's the same opportunity that is offered with the OEN reviews. So like letting them just kind of learn a little bit without them feeling the pressure of the time of I've got to now change my entire course. And uh, one of my favorite faculty stories is just the clarification. And they said that uh, when they the morning that they wrote their review to me, they said they had published one of their articles. And when it was when they were asked if they wanted to pu publish it open access, they felt so excited because they actually knew what that meant <laughs> because they had gone through the modules and like just understanding what these this vocabulary is that we're talking about when it comes to OER. And then I offer a different opportunity, which is the actual OEN review itself. And I wanna um, acknowledge so many things that um, our other presenters have said. I do the exact same things. Pair down the slides, leave time for communication with your faculty, provide a safe open space. I do the same thing. I take the numbers on a one to five scale. How, oh, how are you with OER? Um, those those who say that they're like three to five, I encourage them to tell me the Creative Commons licensing. I ask them to provide me the definitions. It's so wonderful to hear the same things that are happening as best practices um, through different institutions. Um, and I like to provide them that safe and comfortable space, um, which then allows them the comfort to ask the hard questions as well as the comfort with me and having the little conversations to answer the hard questions and answer in like a safe and comfortable environment. Um, some of the things with the OEN review, I do also blend the slide deck with UTRGV specific information. I, every year during Open Education Week, I put multiple uh, engagement posters outside the library that ask pretty deep questions like the, have you ever dropped a course? Because of OER, what do you do when you see the price of a textbook? And I let students kind of just put stickers and then I, I culminate all that information and I provide it to our faculty. So they're not only hearing what do students have to deal with on a nationwide scale, but what do our students have to say about textbook prices and how it is affecting them personally. And I use it to kind of compare what's happening on a nationwide scale and what's happening at UTRGV. Um, I also like to ask them engagement questions, like as we're going through the slides, have they experienced students' um, stories? Like what are students telling them when it comes to textbook pricing? As well as the question, you know, when we get towards the end of the presentation, when it's talking about um, what is the quality of OER? Is it any good? Like those slides. Before I get there, I ask them in a perfect world, if you could, what do you want in a resource? Like what, what is what is great for you? And then I and there they always have wonderful things to say. And then instead of telling them OER is good, I try to connect how OER, you know, kind of solves the problems of some of the things that they really want. Like they want engaging content, they want, you know, whatever that may be, they want videos, they want this. I can tell them how OER can connect to those things that they really wanna see from um, their course materials. 
And then um, once they go through that, um, then the third tier is the actual like adoption. And so there's a different stipend for that of adopting OER. So if they've gone through each of these steps, not only are will they need less time to adopt a resource because they've already reviewed one and they already know what OER is, so they're just ready to dive in. Um, it also allows the opportunity for faculty to um, be compensated the most, which is what I try the most to do is like your time is valued and valuable. Um, or if a faculty just kind of starts with the Texas Learn OER and they're like, mm, this isn't for me right now, it also provides that opportunity for them. They learned and then they're going to take a step back and maybe it's an idea for them to pursue in the future. So tips for overall success. Um, there's just so many different opportunities and possibilities, and it really takes time to grow a program. You don't have to do it alone. Utilize campus partnerships and rely on the open community, which is so amazing, um, to help kind of create and curate your content and choose projects that really fit your program size and your institutional needs. Um, meet faculty where they are, kind of like um, what Jim was saying about the different tiers of faculty, you know, really understand what their concerns are and meet them where they are and then move them forward. And it's okay if some of those movements are smaller than others. And I always also like to say, um, think about your program sustainability and what you offer as you grow and um, try not to compare yourself to other programs because we are all funded differently. We're all um, at different levels. We all have different capacities. So maybe take bits and pieces of what you found and modify it to how it fits you and your institution and you can grow from there. Thank you, Gabby. Um, can you share a quick question that, that appeared in the chat? How do you deliver the learning modules? Is it on an LMS or something different? I will share all the links. Uh, in the chat right now. So you can see all the different modules and how I've modified the slides. Perfect, thank you. Thanks a lot, Gabby. Um, my name is Micah Jeltsma. I work at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. Um, I've been here for about two years. Prior to that, I was at Ball State University in Indiana. So here at Minnesota, I've been able to really focus on OER specifically. We've got an OER incentive program. That's all great. That shapes how these workshops go. Um, but I've also had experience at a university that um, did not have an incentive program and tragically was not an OEN member, at least at that time. So um, I will be talking about kind of those virtual, uh, you know, what is OER workshops that I put on the calendar and some of the things that I've kind of experienced and learned from those. So the first to kind of echo some of my uh, co-presenters here is just kind of reading the room. Um, you know, what are the goals? What are the opportunities? And, you know, are people looking for numbers or narrative? I always find that's a really kind of helpful thing to identify early on. Um, sometimes it can be easier to read the room than others. I think even when I was, um, you know, asked uh, if, if I was interested in um, speaking on this panel, you know, hey, Micah, have you given a lot of successful OEN or successful OER adoption workshops before? And I was like, well, um, successful is a, is a word for sure. I've given a lot of them. Um, I think I've had the experience that maybe uh, will be familiar to many of you where I get 12 people who sign up for my workshop and I get two people who arrive. Um, and sometimes those are really great opportunities, right, where we can kind of turn that workshop into a consultation. So um, it's really great to kind of, yeah, sometimes I'll just ask up front if people want numbers or narrative. Of course, we can all have numbers for our specific states and institutions as far as kind of the efficacy of a lot of OER, but sometimes people want to hear what cool stuff they could be doing, what kind of creative opportunities there are for them to develop their teaching and develop their instruction. Um, so of course we have sort of the usual uh, greatest hits of things, you know, student savings, ease of access, um, customizability. I used to kind of frame things in terms of like, well, you can be free of copyright anxiety. Um, recently, I've kind of flipped that where I'm I'm promoting copyright serenity of, of just always knowing kind of exactly what you're allowed to do, um, really kind of trying to identify those reasons that somebody might have to click on my intro to OER adoption workshop who does not have a background in the, um, the topic, because it does feel like those are the greatest opportunities in many of those cases. Next slide, please. Um, I also really try to make an effort to use kind of instructor voices rather than my own. Um, I can understand that I'm a librarian. Um, it's hard for me to tell them, you know, like, hey, have you heard about textbooks, you know, and things like that. Um, and just understanding that I am there to provide access. I'm there to provide context. 
Um, but beyond that, for actually making that real sell to them, if they are, you know, a little bit beyond um, the numbers, for example, if they're really kind of looking for, you know, how does this fit my teaching? How would my colleagues um, kind of work with this? Is this something that other people that I respect are doing? Um, sometimes they are strangers to me and it's okay if I'm not one of the people they respect um, initially. Um, but it's really helpful to be able to connect with kind of other instructor voices. Um, sometimes if I get a couple, you know, wins on campus, if I get a couple allies, um, sometimes I ask, like, hey, can I, like, forward people to you? And, uh, you know, if they're in your area or something like that, um, that can be dicey. Sometimes people do CC you and you're like, hey, I'm reaching out, you know, we had some questions. Um, and maybe they never hear back. So we don't want that to be a negative experience. But that's an option. Um, involving campus partners, sometimes, you know, they are you know, connected to the libraries for different things, different aspects that you, they can be helped with. Um, OER is not a library resource. So sometimes that's not an area where it's easy to connect them with. Um, a lot of things that they're familiar with, but sometimes you can connect them with institutional designers or something like that, instructional design, just to make sure that they have um, some of those uh, opportunities to um, connect with people that they're familiar with working in a working relationship. Um, open textbook library reviews are really awesome as well, um, just to be able to show people, you know, these are your colleagues, these are your peers, and this is their experience. In many cases, quite critical, um, which I find to be very useful as well, just to kind of give it sort of that validating opportunity. Um, and sometimes you just never quite know. Sometimes that is why it is good to, you know, open for questions throughout. I think my most successful uh, workshop ever, I think I was speaking to a faculty learning community where, um, you know, a group of faculty from different schools um, sort of collaborated over the summer, you know, met, met four or five times, and I got to uh, give a guest lecture on uh, introduction to OER. Um, everybody was a little bit kind of middling. Uh, the, the temperature was mild in the room. I kind of gave it, gave the talk, and they're like, wow, that sounds like a lot. Would be really cool. Sounds like a lot. Um, and then one individual started asking some, like, pretty pointed, cynical questions about uh, kind of my, my spiel there. Um, and of course, we're we're kindly librarians. I was like, oh yeah, of course. Like, I'd yeah, I'd love to speak to your concerns. Can you be a little bit more specific about you know what this means in your teaching and in your department? Um, and then uh, he uh, over time uh, revealed that he in fact had written the textbook that he assigned. Um, that changed the temperature of the room a little bit. Um, and then uh, I kind of uh, you know not that I was like pressing him very hard, but then he revealed of his own volition that he he thought it was actually not a bad thing that the chemistry textbook cost $300 because it made sure that you knew that the students were really serious. Um, and at that point, the entire room really flipped on this guy. I felt kind of bad, um, but I didn't have to say anything else. And they all argued for 20 minutes with, with raised voices about how like, no, this is so important. This is so important that we do these things. Um, got out and, you know, the coordinator apologized to me and was just like, I'm so sorry, that got really rough in there. And I was like, no, that was that was my best my best workshop ever. So um, really being able to kind of um, find those instructor voices, um, sometimes, you know, just taking their quotes, if you can get a quote or, a, a, you know, some sort of endorsement that you can use in your slides, something like that, um, I find can be really, really helpful. Um, and usually kind of, you know, when I'm leaving that, that room, you know, how do you kind of um, you know, take the off ramp from these really big asks, right, where even considering a textbook is such an enormous undertaking. Um, it's really hard for somebody to be like, sure, okay, well, I've got, you know, after this workshop, I've got 20 more minutes of my lunch break, um, I'll consider a textbook. Sometimes they can, of course, and that's great. That's where the, you know, OTL reviews and things like that are really helpful. Um, but I always like to have really uh, accessible ways that people can engage these open ideas, um, you know, the day of that workshop, things like, hey, like, you know, when's the last time you refreshed your slide decks? Do you know where those pictures came from? Um, and being able to, you know, talk about like, hey, here's a really easy way that you can kind of find some images that you can use for this deck, um, any future things if you need to. Um, again, kind of uh, underscoring that copyright serenity, um, just having that real confidence and, and the knowledge that, you know, going forward, um, you'll never have to wonder if your use is sketchy or things like that. Um, or also sometimes I'll ask them, but like, hey, like, um, especially helpful if you do have a small room. Um, are you sharing with your colleagues? Are you sharing your learning materials? You know, do you have kind of junior colleagues that you're helping out? Are you a junior colleague who is, you know, receiving resources from other individuals? Um, you know, how are you distributing these? Are you, you know, do you have a Google Drive that you're connecting people to? Do you host this on your website? Um, and then just kind of asking them, like, how would you want people to engage those materials? How would you want people to take those? What do you want them to do with them? What would you allow? 
Um, and then often they'll have a pretty clear answer. Often it's very permissive and it's like, oh, what a great, what a great opportunity. Wouldn't you love to give some of that copyright serenity back? Why don't we take a look at how you can just add this little symbol to a lot of the things that you're already doing um, and really kind of engage with these ideas in such an accessible, easy way that really connects to the work that they're already doing, really kind of brings it home and connects it to the materials they're already teaching from. Um, so hopefully in the future, when they kind of uh, are ready to kind of consider a new textbook, um, they already have some of that familiarity, some of that buy-in with a lot of the ideas that we're talking about. So um, yeah, dream, dream small, I think, in a lot of cases can be a good way to get people on your side. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Micah. I think uh, several of us are going to co-opt that copyright serenity. I really like that. And wow, that was quite a story from your best experience workshop. So um, does anyone have questions? I think uh, you can either type in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself, that is fine too. So anyone have questions for these uh, very experienced uh, presenters from a variety of institutions? Amy, are you seeing the question? Yeah, so Amanda says, what kind of guidelines do I have for the something else opportunity? Um, and I'll I'll drop the link to um, Jen's article in the chat after I answer. Um, so it's you can review anything that adds up to a curriculum's worth, a, a term's worth of curriculum the way that a textbook does. So um, you know, before I specified that, I got a review of like one peer reviewed scholarly article. And I was like, oh, that's not what I meant. So that is why I say like, you might need to look in more than one place or combine multiple things. Um, it is okay to review a library resource, um, even though that's not open and it's not free because students are already paying for access with their tuition and fees. So I hope that answers your question. And I see other questions too. So let me grab that link and stop talking. Um, Rebel has a good question. Any areas that haven't been successful that you would avoid in the future? Anyone, feel free, any of our presenters, feel free to unmute. I think I'll try to, my biggest thing that's unsuccessful is with people not attending. Um, and so that's why I've tried to partner with other um, campus partners where faculty are used to finding professional development and joining their community instead of trying to create my own community because faculty are already bombarded with all the different opportunities that are available on campus. So where are they already looking and what listservs are they actually <laughs> looking at and seeing if I can partner with those instead of trying to build my community. Um, and so I'll start there as a, as a challenge. And I'll hop in too. Um, in addition to what Gabby said, I um, we have a our our president does a newsletter um, that probably comes out once a month. Um, so I really try to get things in that because I figure that's a, a high profile, um, you know, communication that people are more likely to pay attention to. <laughs> Um, so that's another option if you have something like that. Okay, let's see. Thank you for that. Uh, how often do you typically offer these workshops? A couple of times a semester? Um, Amy says once a quarter, three opportunities on different days, times. Does anyone have a, a different response or a, a rhythm to offering these that has really worked well for you? I offer my mini professional development grants each semester. So uh, one Texas Learn in one semester and then the OEN reviews in the other to provide that. So it's one major each semester and then the adoption grants are run every semester. So every semester I have a mini professional and the major adoption running simultaneously. And the process of developing is monthly or bi-monthly meetings through uh, CTE with the different divisions uh, so that I can focus on the arts and humanities people one time and then uh, some of the STEM people at another time and uh, nursing and allied health, which is my biggest target because it's the biggest program on campus. I, I really am trying to get them by themselves. But I try to looking to do probably two a month. 
Thank you but, for that, Jim. Um, Cheryl asks, when you customize for various audiences, how do you change your message for faculty versus instructional designers versus liaison librarians, et cetera? So how do you pivot and change for various audiences? Anyone want to take that? I think sometimes I mean, yeah, down to those cool. difficult questions, right? Where for the yeah. faculty, you'll let them bring the difficult questions to you. Um, but with the li liaisons or instructional designers, um, that's where I think it's really appreciated for you to bring those difficult questions and be able to kind of really talk through those um, in detail and and really kind of get to the bottom of, of the, um, the tough stuff. I would also say that with faculty, I also tend to highlight the the pedagogical innovation piece um, and and again, kind of the social justice ideals in open education, um, again, because of our context specifically. Um, and then like with administrators, um, I think more as far as as providing data. Um, in addition to, um, you know, kind of impact data is especially important, I would think, with them. Um, but yeah, so that's just another idea. Thank uh, you. I, oh, sorry, Jim, I'm go ahead. Sorry. Just saying, I, I try to really read the, my audience and listen to them. I, you know, I have a, a, a background in, in retail management, and I learned a long time ago is that start a conversation, but uh, the old adage, I have one mouth and two ears and use them accordingly. And then, and, you know, try to develop the strategy from that. Thank you. Um, Anne-Marie says, I like the idea of allowing room for conversation, but I've found that some questions go down a rabbit hole. We really don't have time for and or isn't relevant to everyone. How do you balance that? I'll just say um, before I open it up is that I've seen my boss Dave Ernst say those words. You know, I'd love to get into this, but this be can become a rabbit hole. And so let's stick to, you know, and let's not get out of scope. And then if we have time at the end, let's come back to this. And I think that's kind of a gracious way to handle it. Um, any Anybody else with tips for that? I always yeah, offer I them my email and, and office phone number and say we can continue the conversation individually and not uh, take up too much time for everyone else's time. Yeah, and Dave is such a diplomat. <laughs> I, I think too, like, um, it, it really is okay to kind of like let the discussion continue as long as it's collegial and just trust that you're going to cover everything you need to cover. Um, maybe you'll spend a little less time on something else. I know that I really need to save time to go over logistics because people always have questions about that. And I really want to show the three places that I recommend for search, the Open Oregon Resources page, the Open Textbook Library, and OER Commons, and why I recommend each of those different places. So as long as I've got time for those two things at the end, we can go slower or faster on some of the other topics if people are really interested or if they're being really quiet, you know, depending. I completely agree. And I think we've all talked about modifying slides. There's a lot of slides and they're absolutely wonderful. So really being particular when you're choosing which ones you want to add in and, you know, and if they love a, a topic, you can then host and invite those same faculty and then host a different topic on, on that same. So just continuing the conversation um, at a different time on that topic that they were interested in. And I don't know about you all, but lately the questions that have been the rabbit hole have been inclusive access or equitable access. That's the question where everybody kind of wants to stop and talk about that. Um, Anastasia says, uh, asks, does everyone generally seem to get traction with these in the presence of a grant incentive? We're not scaled well to offer one. And I'm curious how much traction folks have on these workshops without that incentive, without a grant program. I was typing, but I can also talk. So I, I would be able to pull, um, there's definitely a good number of faculty um, in Oregon who all they do to participate with our program is take a review workshop and they do wind up adopting. And that's why our ratio, um, because the $200 review stipend is really low compared to the student savings over time, right? 
Um, so I, there is evidence that people, um, just by taking the workshop with or without writing a review, they are making a change. And, um, you know, one thing that Gabby said that really resonated for me was the importance of time when you're looking at this kind of assessment data, um, you know, you could, um, have someone who for three years, they're just like, no, I never did adopt nothing happened after that workshop. And then the next time you ask them, it'll be like, I persuaded my whole department to adopt. And now, you know, you start to see the savings pile up really quickly. Um, so I, I do think that this workshop can be really effective in the absence of other kinds of incentives. Thank you, Amy. Um, I've been told that we're at time. So I'm gonna stop those wonderful questions. Thank you for um, uh, all of your engagement. And thank you so much, presenters. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise and your tips and best practices with us. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, if today's session sparked ideas, questions, thoughts, whatever, we encourage you to continue the conversation in the OEN Google group, um, or feel free to reach out to anyone on our team. Finally, we want to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be shared with you via email and posted to the community hub in the coming weeks. Slides and transcripts will also be linked. Thanks to all of you once again for joining us, and we hope that you have a great rest of the afternoon. Mm -hmm.